could, if I could just have everyone's attention. This th is the mic working? I guess it is. Uh, I'm Elliot Gerson, uh, an executive vice president of the Aspen Institute, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome all of you here this afternoon. You know, I was thinking about this, and while the Aspen Institute is now uh, a very large organization, and I see some unfamiliar faces here, so some of you may not know all the things we do. We don't actually know all the things we do either. Uh, <laughs> but we have become uh, a very large uh, uh, organization uh, uh, based right here in Washington with outposts uh, elsewhere in the country. Of course, our, our home originally was Aspen, Colorado, and it still is some of the time. And we now have outposts in 10 countries around the world. We have more than 30 policy programs. Uh, we have leadership programs for outstanding young people, not just around this country, but in more than 40 countries around the world. Uh, we have seminars. Uh, we have programs now focused particularly on young people, uh, and our policy programs r are extraordinarily broad, ranging across both domestic policy and international policy, uh, from the arts all the way to the sciences. But as, as we think about it, we really are at heart an educational institution. And indeed, in some of the forms of our mission statements, we say that expressly. So I, I think it's always especially nice to welcome groups of people here who are passionate about education. Because if there were really one word to explain what Aspen is all about, it is education. But today, we're dealing with education policy. And here, too, we have a very long commitment uh, to education policy. And one thing in particular that it's worth noting is that that commitment is a long-standing one, and it's a perennial one, it's a strong one. Uh, it transcends administrations, it transcends eras, it transcends uh, political uh, trends and, and developments. Uh, and obviously the high school dropout challenge is one of those challenges. Uh, we at the Aspen Institute do not go away. Uh, some institutions do, some administrations do, uh, but this is a problem uh, that we have stuck with and will stick with until it's a problem of the past. Uh, all of, and I also, as I think across our policy landscape, uh, we really have a critical mass of policy programs, even though I explain that they cover many, many different subjects. We have a critical mass of them focused very much on education. Uh, and wh what exactly do we do at Aspen relating to education? And what do the various things we do have in common? First, uh, we work to improve public education by inspiring, informing, and influencing education leaders across policy and practice with an emphasis most fundamentally on achieving equity for low-income students and students of color. And we do this via a variety of public programs. As I said, I think we really have a critical mass relating to education, including our program, uh, long called Education in Society, headed by Ross Weiner, who's here in the room, and of course, a co-host of this event. Also by hosting the National Commission on Social, Emotional, and Academic Development, uh, which you'll hear more about, and which is one of many, many things uh, that bridge the Aspen Institute with various entities associated with our great friend John Bridgeland, uh, who will be uh, speaking to you as well. Uh, in higher education, uh, through our College Excellence Program, a program, again, focused very much on educational equity and particularly focused on, on community colleges, although it's now much broader than that. And through other programs that we have uh, that are very concerned with the educational challenges we have in the country, including our Latinos in Society per program, a uh, program that we have on Native American youth. As a matter of fact, I'm going out to uh, uh, a Sioux reservation uh, in South Dakota next week where this is going to be a major focus of what we uh, do. Uh, uh, 
Uh, also, uh, we have a really extraordinary program focused on a two generation, focused really with a, a lens of two generations uh, to uh, move parents uh, and their children toward educational success and economic security. And all of the things we do across all of these programs, we convene groups like the group here together today uh, that are diverse by design. Uh, policymakers and practitioners, union leaders and reformers, of course, Republicans and Democrats. And we do this to question conventional wisdom, uh, to elevate evidence over ideology, and to promote innovation in everything we do, and especially in areas where the challenges are just as vexing as possible, which of course has been uh, a, 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 the, the challenge that we all are here today to discuss. And we also provide venues, whether they're here in Washington or anywhere else in the country or the world, for a really authentic and deep learning and honest dialogue, and produce ranges of resources and tools to continually improve our policy and our practice. So for all these reasons related to sort of the essence of what we think we are and what we do at the Aspen Institute, we are incredibly happy to host the release of the 2017 Building a Grad Nation report. Uh, with special thanks to our four partners, and we look forward very much to the dialogue about opportunities and challenges to reach 90% uh, graduation rate by 2020. Uh, it is now my pleasure uh, to introduce Nicole Anderson, who's the Executive Director of Philanthropy at the AT&T AT and President of the AT&T Foundation, uh, responsible for their operations and strategy of its charitable corporate giving programs, including, of course, the signature program, uh, AT&T Aspire, which is a $350 million commitment to drive innovation in education to ensure that all students succeed in school and beyond. So thank you all very much, and I hope things are very productive this afternoon, and a very special welcome to Nicole. Thank you. Thank you, Elliot. It's wonderful to be here today at the Aspen Institute with so many passionate people who share the same dreams for our young people that we do at AT&T. As a corporation, we're used to using data to measure the results of our business, to know if we're doing the right thing and having the right impact. And so when we decided to focus on high school success and make a public commitment to help increase the high school graduation rate in 2008, we took a data-backed approach to solving that problem. Then and now, we seek out and fund evidence-based interventions so we know that there are dollars, the time our employees are giving, are driving real results for the young people who are at risk of not graduating high school. And just like it does for our business, data illuminates for the country the path forward when it comes to graduation rates. The annual Building a Grad Nation report is the repository that aggregates this important data and shines a light on where we need to go. We're proud to be the lead sponsor of this year's report as we have been since the inception of these reports. It's important work and it's why we fund it. And we're at a midway point today. It's been five years since the, we've had ACGR data, a federal standard for state data reporting, and we have five years of grad rate reporting left until we come to that all important year of 2020. So it seems the right time to reflect upon what the data is telling us. And what it tells us is sobering. About half the students in American public schools are low income, that the equity gap is real. There's no denying it. There's no denying the data. But the question remains, what are we gonna do about it? The data is one piece. And until we believe in our hearts that these children, that all children are our children, we won't have the perseverance necessary to reach our goal. That's why the combination of grad, grad Nation and the five promises put forward by the America's Promise Alliance, especially the notion that all children need a caring adult in their life, is so critical. It's why we've committed to invest 400 million, we upped it a little bit, since 2008, <laughs> <laughs> along with our employees' time and talent and our company's expertise in the AT&T Aspire program. 
We're looking forward to the next phase of work and our continued focus on implementing the five promises guided by the data before us. I'm so proud to introduce our next speakers, Bob Balfans and John Bridgeland. Um, Bob and Bridge and their amazing colleagues at the Everyone Graduate Center and Civic Enterprises, along with America's Promise and the Alliance for Excellence Education, have released the annual update to the nation on graduation rates today. This year's report lays out the improvements, continued challenges, and policy recommendations that we collectively must implement to drive to 90%. It's my, imp it's my privilege to introduce our data kings. They show us, by example, what can be accomplished when you stay focused on the data and combine that with true grit and heart and a love for, for all our young people. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Bob Balfens, director of the Everyone Graduate Center at the Johns Hopkins University School of Education. It's long to get that out. You're ready to go. And John Bridgeland, President and CEO of Civic Enterprises. Thank you. Thank you so much, Al. Thank you so much. Thank you. I don't, I don't want to interfere with a hug. Uh, you know, so many of us travel so much, including Nicole, thank you for traveling this morning to be with us, that we, we don't know what, what day it is or what hour it is. But Senator Harris Wofford, <laughs> who has inspired so many in this room and so many across our country and grounded us in a commitment of service uh, across nine decades, including marching with Martin Luther King, uh, going to Howard University at a time when that was unusual, um, being John Kennedy's peace director, uh, leading the Corporation for National Community Service, of course, being a senator from Pennsylvania, that's almost like an afterthought. And I just want a, a warm round of applause for, of course, Harris is here, right? So, so I just want to begin um, this this effort in the country, which is unfolding, you know, with parents and students and loving, caring adults and teachers, administrators, uh, with the governors, with the chiefs, and has been ongoing for you know a couple of decades. Is a real hope spot for America at a time when America could really use it. So I actually want to begin with a little thanks, if you don't mind. The first is to the Aspen Institute. Um, yesterday, for the past three days. I've been with Ross uh, Wiener um, in Cleveland Public Schools doing site visits and the experience we had there and the looking at how children develop and learn what the science tells us about that and how the Cleveland Public Schools that were sort of in the bottom of the barrel on high school graduation rates are embracing this sort of strengthened model of teaching and learning and student-centered support uh, is kind of a microcosm of what Bob and I are, uh, are going to talk a little bit about today. So I just want to do a shout out to the Aspen Institute, to Walter Isaacs and Elliot Gerson and Ross. There's no better place really to have a nonpartisan, rich, engaged conversation to move ideas and, and agendas uh, in the country, particularly since some of our public institutions are increasingly less and less the places to do them. Uh, second, I want to thank AT&T, you know, yes, a $400 million investment through Aspire, but then they come marching along with mobilizing one of America's greatest companies and workforce across the United States in like a million plus hours of mentoring of students in need. It's just an incredible commitment. And then they support more than 205 uh, summits across the United States across the last decade that prompted plans of action for communities, districts, states to understand their dropout challenges and actually create local plans of action that then Duke evaluated and said were, uh, for the most part, really extraordinary plans. So you've unleashed all this energy across the country. I just want to thank Nicole, Randall Stevenson, Charlene Lake, Kathy Freeze. Let's hit them all. We've got Nassers <laughs> joined us. We, in fact, can you just stand and be acknowledged? Ed Rust and Kathy Havens-Payne and Chris Stiles of State Farm have been uh, America's Promise partner and our partner for many, many years. Um, and then American Graduate <laughs> is an extraordinary thing, but public media, which in your, you go in and you read E.B. White's description on the wall of what public media is all about, and then you see public media emerge with an American Graduate in initiative from the news hour to 100 affiliates across the United States, TV, radio, digital, online not only covering the dropout issue and having student reporting labs going into the schools and covering the dropout issue from their perspective, but then using their convening power 
and everybody shows up. They want the coverage, they want the attention, they want the connection, and it's a credible institution. Show up in these communities to help move the agenda. I want to thank Stephanie Harrison, Pat Harrison, Deb Sanchez for you know the, the, the many years of partnership. We did an analysis showing that in the communities in which public media is active, We've actually had uh, significant increases in high school graduation rates. Not causation, but strong correlation. <laughs> so, final thing is, final thing is, you know, like partnerships are so hard. You know, John Gompertz is like a brother to me, so it's a little bit easier. But having General and Mrs. Powell as your kind of commanders and leaders of this entire effort, and John Gompertz and the America's Promise team, which is one of the most sophisticated, outstanding teams we've ever worked with, uh, really co-leading this effort, and of course the great national treasurer Bob Balfance and his whole team at Everyone Graduate Center. Bob wrote a report in 2006 called Locating the Dropout Crisis. It showed that 50% of dropouts were located in just 15% of the schools, which enabled like a classical, you know, classic engineering response, get the right supports to the right students in the right places at the scale and intensity required. And that gave the nation hope, including all these business leaders we started working with, that maybe we could actually make progress <laughs> And then with the rigor that AT&T brought to us and, you know, for Mandel Steve Stevens on down in terms of accountability and reporting, we committed to stay accountable to the country every year and keep this on the national map. And Kathleen's telling me to move it along. So I'm going to. Um, <laughs> finally, there's no finer uh, former governor, congressman, and uh, person with which we work than Governor Bob Wise. And he's done so much on this, on education policy, but he's been the the uh, sort of education policy engine at the federal and the state level. And having a, formal, a former governor and congressman do those things with his team like Phil Lovell has been a, a gift to the country. So this is the eighth annual update to the nation, um, believe it or not. Uh, the effort uh, started many years before we started updating, um, creating the report and the Civic Marshall Plan. Uh, but we wanted to share with you uh, the progress and challenge in raising high school graduation rates, what we can tell you, and uh, where, we're, where we're headed. So uh, as Nicole briefly mentioned, um, we're at record levels, 83.2% high school graduation rate in 2015, the latest year. That's up from 79% when we started measuring under the common calculation this cohort rate. But what, what's really cool, and I talked to the National Center for Education Statistics today just to reconfirm it again. Uh, we started with an average freshman graduation rate in 2001. In fact, we started measuring graduation rates in 1870, just right after the Civil War. And in a Nation at Risk report said the one hope spot in the country is that we actually were steadily increasing grad rates. And then for 30 years, we had flatlining high school graduation rates in this country, more than a million students dropping out every year. And so what does that mean? Since, since um, 2001, we've had um, 2.8 million more students graduate from high school rather than dropping out. And that's, that's an extraordinary thing. Um, and the, the average freshman graduation rate and the cohort rate track very closely. It gives us additional confidence that the data is good. The progress, though, and Nicole referenced it, we also have the dark times. Um, is tempered by you know slowing progress, persistent grad gaps between some groups, and uh, very legitimate questions over the validity of rising grad rates, which we're going to touch on today. So about half the states are actually on pace, uh, have an 85 percent or more grad rate, which means we, we know we can actually do this. And there, you'll see in a minute places all over the country. Bob's large dropout factories uh, cut in half from 2007, a decade ago, to uh, less than a thousand. I think we've gone from like two point some million students down to 900,000 yep. students attending yep. them. Uh, some big cities like Cleveland, 50% uh, up to about 69%, double digit gains, but they're at 69%. They're close to being still a low graduation rate high schools. Uh, but I'm going to add one thing to that. Yeah, Sorry. please. We're interactive now. Um, Good. One of the amazing I things love it. of uh, a. <laughs> of, uh, of our progress that we lose sight of, because it is true that a 69% graduation rate for a big city doesn't sound that fantastic. Um, but if you turn back the, the clock to the 2000s, the typical big city was in the 40s and 50s. That was the norm in most big cities was that most of the kids are not graduating. You can only find one city, big city right now that's in the 50s. That's the new floor, even that's the, and, and most big cities now are in the 60s and 70s and even some are broken 80s. So that's been actually a remarkable transformation because many people thought these cities were impervious to improvement. 
would have been the betting line in the early 2000s. You'll never move a big city. You might move a smaller place, whatever. But that's where a lot of the work has been, and that's where a lot of the progress has been. So even though there's a lot to go, it's a dramatically different place in those cities, even though there's still too many equality gaps than it was a decade ago. Yeah, I just add to Ed Week is here, and we're going to uh, Lisa Stark is going to moderate the panel. Um, in the early days when we did that first summit with America's Promise Alliance and uh, the Gates Foundation and Time and MTV, uh, Ed Week through the Diplomas Count uh, program, uh, poor Patty Stonecipher, who was from Indianapolis and ran the Gates Foundation, was on stage. And she kept leaning over and saying, is my hometown really at 34% graduation <laughs> rates? <laughs> and we thought that was a little low, but the data showed it was a, at about 36 or so. so. So finally, uh, we need to double the rate of progress over the next five years. But that's just sort of the national picture. As you go deeper into the states and districts and these equity gaps, um, we have to make progress. Bob will talk about the five drivers in a minute. Just This map shows you that we're actually making progress all across the United States in different areas with different diversity. And we even have some states that are closing the low income gap. And we've done some separate reports on how they've been doing that. But we also, of course, have states that are languishing. In one state in the gray, Alabama, it, it's a... Uh, it's on probation. The, yeah, it's definitely <laughs> probation. It's, it's under federal <laughs> audit. So we're uh, very careful in looking at uh, both the progress and challenge. Bob, over to you. Yeah. Um, so we're now really going to test the bridge and Bob mind meld. Because I'm going to do this without looking back there. And he's going to anticipate <laughs> where I am to move the slides. So that'll be the fun excitement. Um, so how do, we keep, how do we pick up the pace? How do we get to 90%? We made good progress, really large progress. It doesn't know what happened. But we're, we're slowing down a little bit. The pace of improvements, you know, which is a normal thing. You have a big shoe, then you sort of level off. How do we get that next bump to get us to 90%? And really, there's five areas where we have to focus. These will not surprise anybody, but we have to keep reminding ourselves. So the first is with low-income kids. And in fact, to get to a 90% grad rate for all with equity, Four out of those five kids that we need to turn from dropouts to graduates have to be low-income kids. In most states, actually, the graduation rate for middle and upper-income kids is close to or over to 90% already. Right? The national graduation rate for low-income kids is about 76%. That hides some range behind there. Some, a dozen states, it's still below 70%. A few other states have pushed to the 80s. But that's where the work is, right? is with, the, with those kids. Um, Low income and race in our nation go together. Um, so we know that also our, the uh, students of color, just cheated, right? Um, <laughs> students of color um, are another big challenge. If we, we didn't do our Rose Bowl uh, picture this year, we see how many Rose Bowls there are. But if you can imagine, there's it's still three Rose Bowls more of kids to get to 90%. One of those would need to be African American students, one of those would need to be Latino students, to give you a perspective on the, the scale of that. Now, both these groups have made have been the drivers of progress over the past decade. So again, this is the good news, bad news story. Real progress, considerable gaps to go. Now, what's interesting, too, and we, and we uh, make this a point in this report, is this is the era now of state-led improvement, right? The feds have stepped back. The state said, let us have the ball. The feds said, here it is. Um, and now it's really up to the states to drive their improvements. And what we find in this report and we highlight is every state has some, at some level a different challenge. I mean, they come in groups, but they're not all the same. And so, for example, for African-American kids, the places where there are the greatest gaps and where they're still graduating, often in, still at the 60% level in the 60s, right, which is really not, <laughs> not even close to the national level and not where we need to be, is in the Midwest, places like Ohio, New York, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin is where we find some of the largest gaps between students of color and not. And that's that, you know, you know, Latino students, they're highly concentrated in five states. I mean, there are many places, but five states dominate. So to move Latino students, you know, you're talking about those five states, right? Um, students with disabilities, there yeah, you go. Yeah, it's working. <laughs> um, back to my Rose Bowl metaphor. Two out of five students in those three Rose Bowls need to be students with disabilities. Next to low-income students, this is where the bulk of the work is. And the challenge, and actually just yesterday, the National Council of, for Learning Disabilities put out their most recent report on the status of students with learning and attention issues. Um, and this is a place, again, where it's as much state policy as school actions. They interact. There's widely different state policies 
and what's expected of students with disabilities, the supports they get, and even the belief that they can actually get a diploma. But the evidence is clear that 90% of students with disabilities are fully capable of earning a standards-based diploma, right? It's only a small fraction that have really severe sort of disabilities that need some sort of accommodation beyond extra ways or different ways to get the standard diploma. That's still not the norm in too many states. And interestingly enough, when we looked at which states have the greatest, like of their non-graduate or their dropouts, most are, are students with disabilities, it turns out to be the New England states. Right, surprise to me, right? New England states typically have high grad rates. They also, on average, identify more students for special ed services than other states. Some of them are as high as 20% of their students getting uh, special education services. But they haven't figured out how to graduate those kids. So they've identified them. In theory, they're giving them supports, but they're not actually succeeding in graduating them. And that can get into my point, can sort of fly under the radar screen of a high overall average, general belief that New England states are doing pretty good, but when you look at it, not if you're a student with disabilities. Um, and that's how we have to sort of do this state-by-state -state analysis. Um, English language learners is a sort of similar story for a subset of states, particularly late entrant ELL students. Um, and then, take us to our next slide. Yep. Um, Sorry. I know, I know. This, was bothering me. I know, you're <laughs> trying to mess with a mind melt, I know. <laughs> Um, uh, low graduate high schools, right? So we had, we bridge show you the story. It used to be 2,000 high schools produce half the dropouts. That number's been cut in half. The number of students going to those schools has been cut even by more, from 2.3 to 900,000. A lot of that was in those big cities, right, that saw their rates go up. The challenge now is there's about 1,000 high schools left that we would call regular and vocational high schools, 300 or more kids that still have low grad rates below 67%, which is the new definition for ESSA, where if you're below 67%, this, so one of the very few federal mandates left is for low grad rate high schools. They actually don't give the states the choice. They almost the choice in everything else, but for a low grad rate high school, if it's below 67%, the law mandates you must do comprehensive reforms and use evidence-based strategies. That was in one way, that was the one big federal success <laughs> of the otherwise devolution to states in ESSA. Um, when you map where these schools are, only a third of those are left traditionally in the big cities. The others are inner ring suburbs and sort of the deindustrialized parts of America. Small cities and towns that were satellites of industrialization. Benton Harbor, Michigan. Chester, Pennsylvania. Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, where President Trump just was, um, are all places where um, the high schools still have very low grad rates. And folks are essentially cut off economically and socially from the 21st century and rural areas. So it's a different challenge now than it was before. Before, if you got a number of big city reformist superintendents and principals, you could turn over 10, 15, 20 of these schools at a time. Now they're left in ones and twos and threes. And in many cases, it's a single high school, and the name of the high school is the name of the city, is the name of the district, and the mayor went to that school, right? Which is a very different reform situation than if you were the, like the one really, a you know, couple of sets of struggling schools but others are bitter in a big city district. So that's just how we have to change our strategies for a different environment. And then the final thing I'll say we have to keep our minds on is there's another thousand schools that meet that federal definition that are essentially alternative schools, right? The places that are supposed to be second chances for students that are struggling. Some of these schools do really amazing work, but there has been a, an upswing and places that are sort of almost filling a market need, if you will, which are sort of almost for-profit chains of alternative schools that literally are in shopping malls. These are high schools, they build them in a, in a mall or a strip mall. They often run kids through three shifts a day, come for your four-hour shift, work on a computer, have an adult walking around to help you if you want it, bring the next shift in, earn your credits, move on or not. And sometimes this leads to a very bad symbiosis because they need students to make money, so they're recruiting, right? And the old model, if you're struggling, and it could be good or bad, it's, a, it's an alternative school run by the district. They've got to find you, or you've got to find them. They're not necessarily out trying to beat the thing to get students, right? If you're for profit, you've got to fill your classes. You're trying to recruit kids. Schools, or other schools learn, and there was a big story in Florida about this from ProPublica, Pro that if I send my struggling kids there, my grad rate goes way up. Because they're transferring to their school, which they could earn a diploma from. And then it's to that alternative school that may or may not have a high grad rate, 
but they're like, fine, close us down. Like, because what's the alternative, right? So we have to keep our eye on that because that's opening a sort of an escape valve for people that seems appealing, but ultimately has very low outcomes. So with that, you want to touch on leaders at laggards at all? Should oh, we, we can. I think we covered that. Good. That, that, yeah. Okay, quickly, so in the press uh, and in our own work, three legitimate concerns have emerged and we're grateful to Ed Week and NPR and all the investigative uh, journalists and our own teams that are uh, working hard to kind of tease out some of the problems in terms of concerns that have emerged. The three areas are measurement area, gaming the system and lowering the bar. Just quickly on measurement area, so right after the cohort rate came out, we went over to the National Center for Education Statistics, who has this fabulous team, who's in touch with state leaders all across the country. And we asked them, you know, uh, under, under the federal law, uh, states are required to use this cohort, this common calculation of graduation rates. But there are all sorts of definitions that then states can interpret on their own, and, and the Department of Education didn't put out guidance and there was some discussion about whether it should or not. I don't think in this administration there's going to be uh, much of that guidance. But, but we identified about a dozen issues um, with the center that merit attention. And the issue is, you know, are schools, districts, and even states inappropriately removing students uh, from the cohort, students who would otherwise be dropping out? Because that will mask and hide the problem. It will hurt kids trapped in these places. So we try to ferret it out. It's everything like who's a first time ninth grader in some areas. Actually, students who were repeating ninth grade were, you know, uh, not counted, or students who uh, were uh, all of a sudden leaving after eighth grade. You know, we were losing lots of students, particularly in Texas. Uh, when is four years up? Is a question. Does that just go on forever? Um, uh, and then accountability for homeschooling is something I'll talk about quickly in a minute, including our students in juvenile justice facilities across the United States. You know, we have among the highest incarceration rates in the world. Um, are those counted in the cohorts? Now, interestingly, last year we did an analysis to see are any of these individual examples that we're seeing at the school and the district level actually amounting to a bigger story? And we look, did an analysis of uh, the cohort size, and we saw that the cohort size shrank at rates that were comparable to decreases in ninth grade enrollment nation, nationwide, and in some cases actually grew. So we think that in, in some cases uh, there's cause for concern about inflated grad rates in districts, but it's not likely affecting national trends. We have something we've organized with uh, uh, the consortium called the Data Cleanup Crew. We actually have two statewide concerns in Alabama. Um, they're under federal audit uh, because they were either misinterpreting or not filing guidelines with respect to uh, diplomas for students with disabilities. And all of a sudden we saw this big uptick in diplomas for students with disabilities. And of course, the concern is, well, are they lowering the bar for students with disabilities? And those in the field will tell you that 85 to 90 percent of students with disabilities uh, can graduate from high school, and that those efforts, like in Kansas, that have integrated students with disabilities with uh, uh, other students actually are doing better in terms of outcomes for these populations. Also, Tennessee, that was, this was heartbreaking. When we first put out the report in 2010, our, our best case study was Tennessee. And actually, um, uh, the concerns that emerged emerged later, and the gains in Tennessee have been real, in part because the governor early on said, we need 225,000 um, uh, qualified workers in Tennessee over the next 15 years, and uh, they need to be college ready uh, and college persistent. And uh, they focused like a laser on uh, increasing high school dropout rates and focusing on the, the lowest performing schools and doing those things that evidence tell us boost outcomes. But just uh, last year, the State Department of Education self-reported that 20% of students graduated with the correct credits, but uh, actually didn't always um, uh, meet. Uh, uh, there were two foreign language requirements that caused concern. And apparently, in some schools, they didn't follow the social studies course that was required by state policy. Um, I'd also just mention the, the center who I talked again to today, they're sharing model practices with states um, and the accurate calculation of, of, of graduation rates is really increases in importance, as Bob mentioned. You know, I was in Ohio yesterday, I talked to the chief. He was actually, um, the commission was asking questions. They were sort of testifying. And I asked him about uh, low grad rate high schools. And he said, this is you know, our top issue. We're focused like a laser on it. And we talked about if schools are gaming the data then all of a sudden, are they at 75% or 70% and they're, they're not then going to get the supports in the Title VII, or sorry, the 7% of Title I support 
uh, consistent with these district implementation plans to improve these schools. Finally, gaming the system. Uh, Bob mentioned the alternative schools example. Uh, there's a lot of good data on virtual schools in the report. We did a, we went into Richmond, Indiana. Their grad rate grew from 59% to 80%, and most of those gains were real, but we had some worry about homeschooling. We saw a lot of juniors who all of a sudden, their transcripts showed that they were potential, they really on the verge of dropping out of high school, and they were pushed into homeschooling. And of course, homeschooling doesn't have the same accountability with respect to, um, uh, the diploma, and so the concern was, um, is some of that gain, um, in fact, amassed by this homeschooling push-up problem? Finally, uh, because less than 2% of all students are enrolled in alternative schools, and you'd have to assume all, almost 2% are all in alternative schools that are um, either gaming the system or not quality, and 2.5% of the uh, percent of ninth to 12th graders are homeschooled. Um, uh, again, you'd have to assume all the homeschooling children or children who would otherwise drop out to see any kind of impact on the national trend. So we see examples at the district and state level, but um, not at the national level. Uh, finally, I said that before, finally, we have two minutes. Lowering the bar, this has been a big issue. Uh, there's a lot of information in the report. Ed Week did a fabulous story on it. It covers it uh, beautifully, but there's been this concern about uh, lowering diploma requirements to boost grad rates. And the good news is NCES actually did a, a study showing that during the very period when we saw increasing high school graduation rates in the country, it was actually becoming more difficult to graduate from high school, including with exit, uh, exit exams. And then we looked, Bob and I and the teams looked at ACT scores and SAT scores. We looked at AP courses. And those trends were actually encouraging. You would expect ACT and SAT scores to actually go down if more disadvantaged uh, students were now taking those tests because they were graduating high school and wanting to go on, on to college. And in fact, we haven't seen that trend. Bob's just going to quickly touch on, we did this analysis on what's the relationship between increasing high school graduation rates and post-secondary uh, success, Bob. Right. And then Three we'll cohorts in one minute. So. Um, the question always is, sure, grad rates are up, but like we know that high school diploma is not enough to support a family on a family sustaining wage. You need a high school diploma and some sort of post-secondary schooling or training or certificate uh, to get that. So maybe our grad rates are better, but are our post-secondary uh, pathways better? So we look closely at this, and we do by looking at three cohorts of young adults, because that's the end game. Are young adults prepared to be successful? So we looked at 25 to 35, 25 to 34 year olds in 2015 those that will be 25 to 34 in 2025, and those will be in 2035, and there are different points of their schooling. The most recent 25 to 34 year olds are the first cohort where, the, where half of them at least have some sort of post-secondary credential, right? Either a four-year degree, a two-year degree, or a certificate is the first time the nation broke 50%. So that's progress, that's a milestone. Half the people now of the younger generation have some sort of post-secondary degree or credential. That also tells us half do not in an era when it's, there's limited work if you just have a high school diploma. The kids that are right now that were really the kids of, um, and I find this most interesting, the NCLB, race to the top, um, Bush Obama kids, if you will, the height of ed reform, um, those are the kids that will be 24, 25 to 34 year olds in 2025. They are now entering college more in life. They've you know, been through the pipeline. Two good things about this group. One, their grad rates and their college enrollment rates are up by 10 percentage points, right? And as, as Bridge said, their college readiness markers are about the same as the prior cohort, which was much more advantaged. So we have a more disadvantaged cohort graduating at a higher rate, which means there is just more, in sheer numbers, low-income and minority kids graduating college ready than ever before, right? That's why, keep it in our heads, if we look at the percents, we can get depressed and say it's flat. But if you understand that same percent we're driving more disadvantaged kids through at that same level, means in terms of absolute numbers, there are more kids than ever, low income minority, graduating college ready. So if you follow those trends through, that's gonna probably push that rate from 50 to 60% for that cohort. And this might be the most successful cohort ever, because it will both be one of raising educational attainments and opportunity gaps closing. Because a lot of the gains in, a, in educational attainment in the past 30 years were actually driven by largely middle class and upper, in, upper class <laughs> income women, right? There was a huge shift basically that anyone from the middle class and the upper middle class 
got their daughters college degrees <laughs> over the last, and that's what drove the national numbers up. That can actually create opportunity gaps when that's played out. Um, but now this is gonna be the first cohort where the, those will close and the number will go up. The group to worry about are the kids that are in first to 10th grade right now. They're gonna be the 25 to 34 year olds of 2035, right? Um, and we know that among that group, the system's not working for one third of the kids, right? About 17% aren't graduating, about 70% of the kids that are graduating are not college ready by really any metrics and they're not enrolling in college. That's about a third of the kids. That's the group that for us to keep moving that, to keep having educational attainment rising and opportunity gaps closing, we gotta move that final third that's struggling the most. And the scary thing is, is like, if those kids are not close, right? It's not like a summer program is gonna tip them over or a little more guidance. These are kids that are, all these sports are either dropping out of school or they're graduating with low C and D averages, right? So they are not, they are a distance from college ready. And so that's where we have to, I think, rethink in many ways what we're doing, because I don't think just doing a little harder what we've done <laughs> is really gonna get to that group. And if we wanna keep that opportunity pipeline going, that's the group we have to worry about. Great, so we're, we're finishing. We're wrapping. Uh, the good news, you know, this seems a little data geeky, but I'll tell you, being with Eric Gordon, who's the superintendent of Cleveland Public Schools yesterday, he's all about the data. And what does the data tell him that shapes policy and practice and action? And that's why he's made, I think, double digit gains in high school graduation rates. And uh, so, in terms of the way forward, um, you know, these ESSA implementation plans that Bob talked about are going to be so important. And we're already working with eight chiefs who've come to us to say, we, we need help and let's collaborate. So the campaign is already you know, underway and working with uh, a number of chiefs. Um, I won't go through these other things. I'll do, I will note that if you uh, report, 31 states report five-year graduation rates, and that boosts the national graduation rate by 3%. We know that we don't want to move away from the incentive actually of getting um, students to finish in four years, because we know if they don't finish in four years, they're more likely to drop out. At the same time, not all students have ideal circumstances, and we want to give an incentive in the system to make sure that we, we also help students who take more time. If you add a six-year graduation rate, um, it's another ad additional percentage point, so four percentage points. So by six years, we're really at you know, 80, 87.2%. Uh, the big idea, uh, which is kind of exciting because thanks to the National Commission on Social, Emotional and Academic um, uh, Development, which I'm on, Governor Sandoval, who's the incoming chair of the National Governors Association, and Gover Ma Governor McAuliffe, who's the vice chair, we've been talking to them about what if we were to, building on what Greg Petersmeyer and President Bush 41 did in Williamsburg and convening all 50 governors in 1989 that ushered in the era of accountability, the 90% goal, and I want to shout out Greg, he's been an amazing leader since the beginning. And then um, Governor Mark Warner uh, in 2005 creates, gets all 50 governors, Governor Wise, to sign the graduation rate compact. So we're calling for a next generation governor summit that would finish the job on high school graduation rates, look at how uh, states, you know, and Georgia Tech and these great examples are innovating around the pipeline from high school to college, including career and technical education, occupational certificates, four year and beyond. And then with Business Roundtable and employers and AT&T and others um, looking at what are the pathways into the, the jobs of the future. And we think that's something given the economic imperative, given that's in a sense where Trump won the election in these areas that, you know, the Rust Belt and <coughs> these communities that need economic opportunity, we think it could really take off. We'd love your help. So if any of you know any governors, talk to them, encourage them along. We're starting the bandwagon and start today. The bandwagon. So thanks to everybody. It's my pleasure now to introduce um, uh, just a wonderful human being. I had a chance to spend about an hour with her earlier today in an interview. Her name is Lisa Stark. Uh, she's the moderator of our panel today. She joined uh, Education Week as a correspondent for television and video coverage. Uh, they're very fortunate to have her. And, Ginny Edwards was singing her praises yesterday. Um, uh, she is also a special correspondent for PBS uh, NewsHour, uh, where she reports on topics such as training and supporting teachers, arts programs, homelessness, and debates over charter schools and vouchers. I also looked online, saw she covered the 9-11 attacks, the TWA uh, 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 explosion, the uh, Oklahoma City bomb. I mean, you've had a, the more, <laughs> most diverse, interesting portfolio of any journalist in America. 
She has uh, formerly of ABC News and Al Jazeera America. She's received two national Emmys for her reporting uh, and many awards, too many to name. Please join me in warmly welcoming Lisa Stark. Thank you. Thank you. Well, while this is done, I will, I will go ahead and introduce the panel. Um, thank you again for that introduction. I am delighted to be here. Um, I'm going to start with Governor Bob Weiss. He's the president of the Alliance for Excellence in Education. Of course, he's the former governor of West Virginia. He spent 24 years in public service, right, as a governor, U.S. representative, and he was also in the state legislature. Uh, he was very involved in education as a governor. He signed legislation to create West Virginia's Promise Scholarship, meant thousands of kids could go on from high school on to the next, uh, the next level. And he was also the author of Raising the Grade, How High School Reform Can Save Our Youth and Save Our Nation. We're all for saving Yeah, one of the greatest undersellers, I might yeah, add. Oh, well. <laughs> I, I think he has copies in the back yeah. if you're interested in Yeah. yeah. <laughs> He also has too many awards to name, yeah, but I want to tell you sense. one other thing that you should know about Bob. He has a black belt in Taekwondo. Wow. I wanted to get an education policy. <laughs> I knew it was going to be a fight. Uh, Charlene Brenner is the Deputy Commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Education. She is responsible for running the day-to-day -day operations, but also developing education policy and budget recommendations. She was a 2014 winner of the Leaders in Public Policy Award. And she previously worked in the state legislature as a specialist in communications and public affairs. She's going to help bring a state perspective here. I looked at the report to see how Minnesota's doing. Uh, looks like a lot of other states is doing great in some ways, 82% graduation rate. But a lot of those subgroups we've heard about are challenged there as well. So she can talk about that. And according to her Twitter site, Charlene is a believer in second chances and second acts. Uh, next, Dr. Anthony Terrell, the principal of Mount Vernon High School in Alexandria. He has 17 years in Fairfax Public Schools. And before that, he put in 16 years uh, in military service. He's a veteran of both Desert Storm and the Iraq War. He assumed the principalship, or whatever you want to say, of the helm of Mount Vernon just over a year ago. He's put a big emphasis on academics and student-centered learning there. Um, by my reckoning, the high school is about 79% minority. Is that right? 54% yes. low income? That's right. Uh, but he says, he likes to point out that 90% of his students show up to class regularly on time. Anthony has been quoted as saying, they come for something, and we have to make sure we give them something. Last but not least, Jennifer DePauli, she's a senior education advisor at Civic Enterprises. She says she's a teacher turned researcher. Uh, she began her foray into education as a seventh grade teacher. My sympathy, we've all had middle <laughs> schoolers, we know what that's like. She also taught at the elementary and university level, including helping to educate those who want to become teachers. Before she came to Civic Enterprises, she worked for an Ohio think tank, Policy Matters, where she was a policy researcher there. She calls herself an eternal optimist and says she is fighting the good fight for public education. And we should say she is also the lead author of today's report. So we're going to start with Jen. We're going to have a discussion for a little while here, and then we're going to open it up for questions. So keep those in mind. Um, let me just ask you, first of all, we've heard a lot of the challenges. We've heard that it's going to take a, a real sprint to try to make uh, the 90% rate. So what is it going to take? What do we need to do? What's the first thing we need to do to get there? Yeah, so I mean, I think you heard Nicole point out the equity gaps so eloquently and Bob and Bridge talk about the equity gaps. And um, I, I personally think that where you're seeing it the most is in these low graduation rate high schools. Mm -hmm. And because those schools tend to be really high poverty, tend to be heavily segregated. Um, and those are the schools that, you know, as much as we've tried to reform them in the in recent years, have, for whatever reason, been impervious to reform. Um, and, and I think, most importantly, we have to realize that it's not just the school's fault. I think for so long we have put it on these schools and said, 
you know, they're failing, they're bad schools, they're bad teachers. Um, and we have to start thinking about this in the broader scheme of things. This is a community issue, it's a state issue. Everybody has to be involved. Um, it, it cannot just be within the school. So I think until we start taking that mindset, and I think some places have already done it, and that's where you've seen great success, and I think that's what needs to continue. And Charlene, let me ask you about that, actually. So you, you have said it takes a village, right? You've got to get yes. everybody involved, community groups. Uh, what about that? I mean, is the onus still too much on the schools? You come at it from a state perspective. How much does the state and the community and the policymakers have to be in there with the schools? It really is uh, both and, and I'm thrilled to hear you talk about that. I think for so often, uh, for so long, we actually heard pushback when we would talk about out-of-school factors that influence in-school success, and it sounded like excuse making, and people would say that you're just not wanting real accountability, which couldn't be further from the truth. We know that every student is coming to us with unique needs, and so the shift that we're uh, undergoing in terms of understanding all of those out-of-school factors that kids are dealing with and understanding that it is partnerships that matter. It is looking at housing stability. It's looking at teen moms who need help. It's looking at trying to get those kids who have dropped recently back engaged. It's looking at early indicators. So it's looking at a whole host of things. And I think from a state perspective, that challenges us to think intentionally about what does school look like? And what are the supports that we're setting up? And then how do we best resource them? Right? And I'm not only talking about more money, I'm talking about the structures that we put together and then what's the role of a state agency to really help uh, meet the needs of those high schools that are experiencing those high levels of students with unique needs. And if, oh, go ahead. No, no go saying, ahead. No, I was just saying, of course, that's amidst all the budget issues that Absolutely. states and everybody else and that's a, and, and that's a good news, bad news, right? So we have some additional, a little bit, of flexibility with ESSA to direct some Title I funding to high schools, mm -hmm. but we also suffer from whiplash when it comes to funding. So everybody talks about more resources, but when, it push, when push comes to shove, um, we're hard pressed to pony up. Uh, I'm, I've been looking at my phone frequently during the last hour because we're in the midst of the final two weeks of the legislative session in Minnesota where everybody's giving a lot of lip service to putting more resources in schools. We're fortunate to have a governor. Uh, governor Dayton actually has made a commitment. He's in his uh, last two years of his term. He said, more money for schools every year, no excuses, no exceptions. Hmm. Um, but he also says it's not just more money that matters, it's how do you use it? How do you target it from an equity perspective to the schools and students who need it most? Um, at the same time that he's proposing significant new investment, we're seeing uh, less than half of that proposal in the legislature, funding that wouldn't even keep pace with inflation that would result in large cuts. And you can't cut your way to better outcomes for kids. It's just it's unrealistic. So, so there's a tension between the lip service of policymakers and the reality of the actions. And I would also add, Minnesota has a $1.6 billion budget surplus. So the thought of not so should investing, be right the check. Is that what you're saying? Right. We have an opportunity here to really make a down payment on our state's future. I'm going to ask you about policy in just a second, but I want to tur turn to Anthony. So what, I want some of that money. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Waiter too. <laughs> What's it like? You know, in the schools, you're trying to bring these students along. You have the kind of population we're talking about here, right? Low income, a minority population. There, as we see, they have some of the biggest gaps. Uh, how do you bring these kids along? What's it like on the ground? Right, so we have the advantage of, of not focus, focusing on subgroups because our whole school is a subgroup. And so, <laughs> and so we like to say that uh, a uh, rising tide lifts all boats. And so we come at it from a perspective of high, high expectations for everyone. Uh, and that starts with teacher quality. I try to get the very best teachers in front of these kids, uh, teachers who are gonna connect with kids first, and then try to connect kids with content second. Um, we, we try to make school a, a compelling place for kids to be, <clears throat> um, because we know by the time kids get to high school, they have real choices in how they spend their time. And so uh, when they do show up, as I like to say, 90% of them show up on time every day. Uh, we do like to give them a, a, a high quality experience both in the classroom and outside the classroom. About half of our students, uh, our 11th and 12th graders, about half of that number spend uh, a, a, a part of their day outside of our school learning a trade or um, learning some sort of um, uh, technical skill. And that we have found is a, is a compelling way to keep the juniors and seniors in school 
and to graduate them on time. So we try to make it make our school a compelling place to be. So you're trying to make it relevant to their lives as Absolutely. well, it sounds like. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so, Governor, you're the policy guy here today, I guess, right? You used to write checks for schools I used in West to. Virginia. It was a wonderful day. Yeah. <laughs> wonderful day. Yeah. So what, what, I'm curious about what you see as the role of the federal government, particularly right now, and the state governments as we move into this new phase with, with ESSA, with the federal government dialing back. What do you think we need to see from those groups? Well, let's, let's look at the window of opportunity that we have. There is an artificial device called ESSA, and I say artificial because it's legislative. We've had the conditions that each Charlotte and Anthony and, and have been talking about, these have existed for a long time, but we do have this new federal legislation passed in 2015 that sets certain, that gives states and districts much more flexibility. So no longer is there an excuse for you're telling, you, our school's not performing and you're telling us there are only four ways we can fix it. You now have the flexibility, but the challenge is whether or not you're gonna have the resources as well and have the support. But during this time, this two and a half to three year period, remember every state puts together its plans. And so I like to say every state's identifying its aspirations and then talking about how to implement. Every state must de decide how it's going to define low performing schools and then what will be able to assist districts in developing their plans on how to do something about it. So that's the good spot. The, but the challenge is gonna be though, uh, we got high performers up here, but will there be some that are tempted to, to slide some? Uh, because some of the accountability provisions that you have and under the old no child left behind aren't there right. and that's my main concern but but my real but my but I want to take the asset approach the the positive approach which is you all have already been working on this and you by virtue of being here and a number of others you've de you've demonstrated what can be done now how do we get that word out to a whole lot of others that want to do the right thing and now have the opportunity under ESSA to actually plan at the local level and one final thing sometimes one of the most blessed words a former politician can say. Um, one, a final note is what was also raised here is this is not a schoolhouse-based uh, enterprise. Right. Learning is a 24-7 experience. And particularly with technology, particularly with broadband connectivity, particularly without of workplace experiences that, that Anthony Terrell talked about and others. So we've got to focus on what it is business partners are doing, what it is that community colleges are doing. The reason that graduation rate has been going up has been kind of a total community exercise supporting educators, not, not just asking educators to take it on by themselves. But I wonder, you know, we've talked about, and it was mentioned a little bit when they were talking about the report, we've, we've sort of done the low-hanging fruit in a sense. Now we've really, um, you know, for the last two years, the, according to these reports, we haven't kept pace with where we want to be. So, I mean, is there any one thing that each of you would say is, if I could put my money this way or my effort right in this, this spot, where would that be? Anyone? I, I would speak from the state education agency perspective, which is really to continue focusing on those low grad rate high schools. With really, um, one of the things that we're challenged with is we can identify best practices, but sharing those best practices is not something that we're as effective at doing. We don't um, give time to really share what's working and then contextualize it. So scaling up is a challenge. I would also say a challenge for a state education agency right now under ESSA in particular is going to be figuring out the right level of support for each of those schools. There's a lot of them. So it's not um, just 67%, but we're looking at 67% among any student group, right? Mm -hmm. So trying to figure out how are we offering the right level of support within the structure that we have um, that is appropriately resourced, or how do we do it within uh, the challenge of resources? And I hate to be the money person all the time, right? But it's a, it's a real <laughs> part of my it's a real part yeah. of my daily thinking. Um, I think that that's the challenge. So, so really focusing effort on what's working in those schools where we're seeing it increase, and then how do we share, and how do we, as a state education agency, help share those best practices? So, what's working in those schools? Do you know? I mean, you're not you're not one of those schools, obviously. You're not right. a low graduation rate school, thank goodness. But and you've talked a little bit about what's working. If someone came to you and said, "Okay, I need your best practice," would it be what? One of the things we focused on is the transition from middle school to high school. Yeah. We know that students who have a successful freshman year uh, stay in school and they and they graduate, which is why we are here. And so we have partnered with our with, with our feeder middle school to really focus or to target the eighth graders who are struggling, That's who great. have struggled through middle school. 
because those are the folks who will drop out later in, in high school. And so uh, we, we sponsor summer jump, uh, summer jump start camps uh, for those students in the year between eighth grade and ninth grade to get them acclimated to high school before high school even starts. Uh, and, and we've had great success with that. Uh, we also uh, uh, feature smaller ninth grade classes. Mm -hmm. We know that Algebra algebra 1 is a gatekeeper to graduation in, in, uh, in uh, many places. And so we make sure that our Algebra 1, teach, uh, algebra one classes are our smallest math classes and that we have the best teachers teaching those classes. <laughs> Those sound like great suggestions. I hope everybody's writing those down. Um, and I would add to that too, I, just in terms of the transition and the identification of those kids at risk. So we have in Minnesota what we call the Minnesota Early Indicator oh, and Response gonna System, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's an acronym like everything in education. But I think that the early identification and intervention for those kids most at risk, and you can look at attendance, you can look at all the indicators, you, you well know. I think that that is key to that, and that also helps with the transition process. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that, Jen. How much yeah. that early intervention, um, and, and looking at the data, we're all talking about data, but data is helping these schools figure this out, yeah, how so important that yeah, is. So, yeah, so sometimes I think that you know the, the easiest things are the ones that get overlooked. Mm -hmm. Schools are already collecting data on absenteeism. They collect data on course performance. They collect data on discipline issues, right? Those are the, those are the three big indicators that we know. Um, now it's, it's about putting it into a system that teachers can actually use it. Uh, you know, we, we've been in schools where you know that those things are being collected and yet they're not in any usable form for teachers to actually be able to track those students. Hmm. Um, and then on top of it too, you know, like you were saying, focusing on those freshmen, sometimes it's as easy as making sure each of those freshmen coming in have a connection to an adult in that building. Um, that developing that relationship, making them engaged, and, and, and giving them something that that home base, you know, in addition to the the freshman, uh, you know, I don't know if you call it a freshman academy or what you call it, but mm -hmm. um, you know, having like advisories in the morning to just so those kids have some place to go in, and they have somebody they feel comfortable talking to. Um, it, sometimes those really simple things that we just want to say, no, that can't possibly be the solution. That's the solution sometimes. Um, and so I think sometimes we have to start looking at some of those those simple things that, that schools can do without too much um, more of a burden put on them. And, and I think I've seen studies that say you can actually look back sometimes in elementary school and see what kids are really going to make it through right. high school. So, I mean, you can track back even <coughs> further and start looking at the data. And I know some colleges have been very successful. Uh, Georgia State or Georgia Tech, I think it was one of them, where they, they track the kids and keep them in colleges. So um, let me ask you, from a former governor's perspective, why did you care so much about education as the head of a state? Like, why, why did that matter to you? Because when I was in high school, and that was, of course, 10 years ago, when I was, <laughs> when I was in high school in 1965, a, a classmate said to me, uh, and these words are seared into my mind, uh, education is the only passport from poverty. And that was in West Virginia in 1965, and it is exponentially true today. I see Robert and I see others from West Virginia. Uh, it is, it, it's exponentially true today. And so I want to, you asked where I put the money. I put the money into, I also want to put the money into some uh, education of the public. And Nicole spoke of data. And one of some of the data we use is economic data. Uh, Georgetown Workforce Center, uh, since 2010, 99% of the jobs that have been created since the great end of the Great Recession uh, went to people with more than a high school diploma. Only 1% high school diploma or below. Mm -hmm. Working AT&T supports the summits and then State Farm supports an economic model that we've been working on. Uh, give you an example, one graduation class, if we increase it to 20, 2013, uh, the class of 2013, if we'd gotten 90% graduation rate, by the time they're fully in the economy, 65,000 new jobs. They're all going to be working, incidentally. They're going to create through their disposable income 65,000 more jobs in, over two, in almost $2 billion in federal, state, and tax revenue. That's for one class. So there's an economic imperative that joins with the equity imperative. And then you join the fact of what Bob and Bridge talked about and, and Nicole as well, which is that half of our children are children who are either low income and or uh, children of color or ethnicity, you can see that this is, a, this is an incredible economic imperative. And that's one reason, Bob and Bridge, during your summit, I noticed that governors have shifted a little bit in the last few years. Not, they're not all addressing education, but they're addressing the economy and economic development and the need for training. And that's how I think be one of the ways to bring them in. So I'm curious about um, 
Jen, you particularly, since you since you uh, authored this report and labored over every word of it, I'm sure. <laughs> um, do you what, what makes you the most optimistic when you look at this, I, and what I, makes you the most pessimistic? Yeah, I, being on the ground makes me really optimistic when I actually go into schools and see some of the great things that are happening. Um, knowing that that people, you know, are are doing these things that, like I said, are, they work. Um, and that you know you meet teachers and educators and, and, and administrators every day that are working towards this and you know that they have the best intentions to get those kids across the finish line that that makes me really positive um, what makes me feel pessimistic um, you know I think sometimes now that now that we're getting closer and closer to reaching the 90 percent goal in some states um, it seems like people are backing off and mm -hmm you know, they're, they're not paying as close attention. So I think, you know, we need to have that renewal of this is still important. And, and you know, in some places it's a transition. It's going from not just high school diploma to more, and that's great. Um, but we really have to not miss those students who are already, you know, not going to graduate. So we have to, you know, make sure our focus is in the right place. Anthony, from your perspective, why do you, why do your students drop out? What, what are the students who are leaving your high school? And I'm sure there are some, as, right. as fabulous as you are. <laughs> I'm sure not everybody gets to the to the mortar board. Not what, yet. No, you're, you're going to get there, though. I know. What, you know, what do you see? What's what are the main reasons that you see people not coming back? Recently, we've seen a, a real uptick in the number number of our English language learners who yep. just don't persist. Um, we know from the research that it takes about seven to ten years to master academic language, wow. and um, even even for the most motivated students. And so those students come to us at uh, 14 or 15 with uh, large gaps in, in their schooling, and it's just uh, frustrating for them that that they can't that they that they can't make progress at the pace that they'd like to. And so. Um, then the um, world of work calls them away and they start working you know, 10, 15, then 20, and then 25, and, and uh, eventually 40 hours a week, and school just takes a low priority. And so that's what, that's what we're seeing. We've seen um, since, uh, since the winter break, I've registered 100 English language learners who are, who are at level one English proficiency. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so wow. we're seeing it up and down the uh, Route 1 corridor. And so that's, I think that's our most pressing challenge in, uh, at the moment. Well, let me ask about the changing demographics, because we, uh, and, and, and perhaps you all can talk about that. What are the changing demographics we've seen over the last decade or so, and how do we deal with that reality? How do you deal with those English language learners, for example? I'll just ask you first of all. Sure. Well, well, I've hired more English language teachers. <laughs> that's always uh, a good way to start. That, yeah, that, that's, uh, that's, that's the first way, but, but, we, but we focus on small class sizes. We get them the uh, wraparound services that they need in terms mm -hmm. of social services right. and, and counseling and mentoring and that sort of thing. And we try to um, make school, we, we try to start with the why for school. Why, why is school important? And we talk about the diploma and what that means and what life here means without it. And so, um, and we talk about that often. But again, if a student is making slow progress, it, it's a it's a tough battle. It's frustrating yeah, for them. Sure. What about what, anyone else want to talk about demographics? Or? Well, we were just talking a yes. little bit before mm -hmm. the panel started. Minnesota is one of those Midwestern states that has a really significant gap between our kids of color and our kids of economic disadvantage and our overall population. That said, we've seen really good progress in closing gaps, particularly among our black and Hispanic students. Um, so uh, this report doesn't even factor in Minnesota's 2016 graduation rate, which is about 82%. And we've seen about a 13 point gap closure with black and Hispanic students. Um, that's also remarkable when you think about the context of the significant demographic shift in Minnesota. Right now we have the third largest population of Somali students. We have a huge population of Hmong students. We have a large population of Hispanic students. And that shift has occurred really rapidly. Um, Minnesota is the land of Lake Wobegon and Garrison Keillor, yeah. and where everybody's above average, except it's hard to get to above average when you're not um, supporting educators and the general population to deal with a very shift demographic shift, uh, very rapid demographic shift. So I think that one of our challenges is really equipping educators and the general public and our partners to think about the unique needs of kids who are new to country, kids who are new to Minnesota, kids who are really having the um, 
some of the unique opportunities and the assets they can bring to us, but how do we help them get across that finish line? I would add to, if I could, sure. also when you think about opportunities and challenges, I am an optimist by nature. So when I'm in a school, I'm incredibly optimistic. I'm also optimistic about the shift in the conversation and the recognition that this is more than an in-school challenge for us. I think that that is a remarkable shift as well. I am uh, never pessimistic, but I am frustrated with the balance between the real sense of urgency that exists, we have five years to meet this goal, but the uh, hunger for immediate impact, I always say that kids are not leading indicators, they are lagging indicators. And so to expect something to change overnight is unrealistic. <laughs> so the balance between maintaining our urgency and uh, maintaining a stay the course for what we know works is one of, I'm not pessimistic about it, I just get a little frustrated. Well, well I'm gonna play devil's advocate there for a minute because some might say, We've been working at this for years. Yeah. Why aren't we further away along? I mean, we've made great gains, but oh, we still have so far to go. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm a very rare breed in this town. I'm the guy that always sees it as half full at least. Yep. Uh, I'm optimistic. <laughs> Are you and sure? I'm, yes. In Washington? I'm, and, uh, I'm, I'm optimistic. <laughs> and I'm optimistic, one, because uh, every one of the students that is graduating that would not have graduated and the numbers aren't as high or the percentages aren't as high as we want. But let's remember what they represent. They represent not only the academic and we can, <coughs> did, did they meet the standards that are necessary for today or not. They represent a certain resiliency and grit, call it what you, perseverance, call it what you want. And they also represent a community effort. So yeah. communities came to, have come together in the last 10 years. I also subscribe to the fact that in the last decade, where another reason I'm optimistic, I'm optimistic because of the kind of research that Bob Balfonts and the Chicago Consortium have done that we now have data on early indicators. And so what Jennifer just packed, ticked off, these, these are now becoming routine indicators. We have technology that enables teachers to truly be te and education designers uh, in ways that we don't. We have an appreciation of data and the use of data that we didn't have before. And so I, I see a number, and now we have, as I say, however you feel about ESSA, it provides certain flexibility. And now we have to, each of us and each of our communities gets a chance to, to truly uh, walk the talk that we've been saying about wanting more flexibility and just turn us loose and let us go. We got that now. So I, I think that this is a time, and also the recognition that this country doesn't move ahead if we don't all move ahead. We, when I grew up a few years ago, again, when I grew up, uh, you could have 50% high school graduation rate because you could get out of high school, you could drop out of high school and get a good paying job Absolutely. in the mines, the steel mills, or the chemical industry. You pick your pick your industry wherever you lived. Uh, today, you don't get one. Most of those jobs don't exist. But number two is you don't get into those without post secondary, and so the skill levels of we don't have a choice. <laughs> I mean, I think what was it? By we all have to. We all have right. to move forward. I think by what twenty by twenty twenty they said something like sixty five or sixty nine percent of jobs are going to require yeah. something yes. more than a high school diploma. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, my kids are in college. So I'm taking donations at the door. And uh, you know, I keep thinking like, well, it's, you know, this is nothing now, right? It's gotta be grad school. It, it, it just feels like you've just gotta, the, the bar has been raised so far. I would play devil's advocate a little okay. bit on that. Um, I think that redefining what we mean um, in terms of setting goals and aspirations. So post-secondary, absolutely. <laughs> but redefining it, it doesn't necessarily mean four-year college. That's true. Right? There are really good, skilled, respectable jobs, living wage, and, and uh, important jobs that require some sort of a credential or a two-year degree or that you can work at for a couple of years after attaining that credential and then get back on the track to a four-year degree. So I think that redefining is also part of the aspirational piece when we talk about all means all and getting every kid across the finish line, redefining what we mean about post-secondary so that it's a real and true aspiration and that it's not something that is um, a narrowly defined right. it, expectation of success. It, right, and, and it's an excellent point. I think the point is also that you know one size doesn't fit all. Right. Right. And both in the classroom, right, and outside and the classroom, life. so, and in life, absolutely. Do, were you gonna add anything about the, uh, no, you, <laughs> they're doing a great job. They're doing a great job. <laughs> <laughs> You're the numbers girl. Um, I'm about to open it up for questions in just a minute, so um, get your questions ready. I think are there maybe some people running around with microphones, but before we open it up, um, I just wanna give everyone a, a last chance to, to, to say what you think people need to hear. I mean, I'm wondering if we do have the public will 
to move forward. I think in this room we have the will. I think in pockets we have the will. But you know, I, I get those alerts every day about you know legislatures cutting money, about you know teachers having to crowdsource for all of their school supplies. I mean, it's it's tough out there about you know competing with charters and vouchers and virtual schools and all of these other things. And I'm just wondering if you think we have the public wherewithal to really move forward on this. I think we need, we're in a in the midst of a budget crisis in Fairfax County. <laughs> And as Governor Wise said, this is a civic trust. Public schools are a civic trust. And if we can do anything to educate the public, it's to the importance of, of, of fully funding our public schools. To fully educate the kids that we're talking about is expensive. It's more expensive than kids who show up ready for school. And so we have to be honest about that, and, and we have to sort of put our money where our mouths are. And we're up here, we're kind of long on hope. But hope doesn't educate kids only. You need dollars. <clears throat> I, I, talk, I started out talking about teacher quality. And to, to raise teacher quality, I've got to raise teacher pay. Uh, we're losing rafts of teachers to the districts around Fairfax County because they pay more. And so if I'm left, left with the teachers who didn't get picked up by those districts and then I put them in front of the most challenging kids, then I'm almost nowhere. So I think it, we really have to... Uh, impress upon people that this is a civic trust and it takes all of us. Does anyone else want to add to that? Or? I, yeah, I, oh, go, go ahead. No, go ahead. no, no, well, no. I, no. Just, I think, yeah. yes, the will exists absolutely when you are in school. <coughs> I think the will exists when you're talking to uh, people who do this research for a living. I think the will exists when we look about we look at um, people who are in teacher preparation programs and we look at community organizations who have really partnered with us. I think the overall political will, the overall public will is emerging. Is so emerging? I, th I think it is emerging. I think that we give a lot of lip service to it. I think that the talk needs to match the walk. Yeah, I think it's emerging and we remember still that you know, every census shows us that I think 25% of families or something have kids in the public school system. Mm -hmm. So once again, uh, the reason we started this economic development analysis uh, was that I realized walking out of a large bank one time, if I couldn't talk to the branch bank manager in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina, about why that high school 10 miles away directly affected her income, her welfare, her business, uh, then we weren't going to be successful. So recognizing the importance that the entire community recognizes the importance that all children do well, uh, particularly in an information-based economy. And I think we're becoming more sophisticated. And quite frankly, a lot of the national discussion, uh, as turbulent as it is, uh, I think also, though, is coming to what is it we need to do to create jobs? And what is it we need to do to create good incomes? It's edu education today is the single greatest economic development program. John, did you have a talk? Yeah, uh, so I, my hometown, Erie, Pennsylvania, no. <laughs> um, has made a lot of news in the past year because they are a, a district, uh, the Erie School District has had to basically say they were going to have to shut down their high schools mm. because of uh, lack of funding. Um, and nobody was really paying attention to those schools outside of Erie, even people within Erie, until that happened. And so like you said, it's emerging. As soon as people started being, becoming aware mm -hmm. of this, how dare they shut down high right. schools for an entire city of kids, people got really angry. And, and I wish that outcry had been there before because I, I along with other, other people in Erie, drove past those schools that were falling apart, that didn't have the same resources as some of the resources in the you know, outer, outer suburbs. Um, but I, I think once you make people aware of this issue and, and bring them in, and like you said, internally, the will is there. So we have to make it this bigger issue. And, and I think, like you said, it is a public trust. And we have to, in some places, regain that trust. Um, but in, in a big way, show how, how critical it is to all these other uh, these things that we value. Thank you. Does anyone in the audience have any questions for our panel? I'm going to open it up for a few questions. Oh my gosh, everyone knows everything. <laughs> Come on, guys, wake up. <laughs> okay. All right, we have a hand here. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Emily Samos, and I work with an association of public libraries called the Urban Libraries Council. So I actually want to go back to the beginning of the conversation when you talked about how important the out-of-school time is and what happens during the out-of-school time and um, how important partnerships are. And so I really want to ask principal here, for an example, of are you working with the public library? Are you working with other partners to really kind of bridge um, 
the out of school time with the in school time and look at ways that um, organization, public organizations like the public library can complement and offer learning um, learning opportunities that complement what needs to be learned in school. Sure, we, we're, we're doing that, but, we, but we'd like to do more. Just recently, I met with the Mount Vernon Chamber of Commerce, and uh, we're, I'm looking for ways to make 12th grade more relevant for kids, especially this time of year of 12th grade, when, <laughs> when senior oh, yeah. is, is, is uh, <laughs> deeply embedded. But, um, and one way to do that is through internships for 12th graders. They're, they're done learning. Uh, in fact, we know that, that by this time they've, they've started to forget what they learned uh, previously. And so uh, if I can find a way to partner with businesses to get kids out in the community to have real life experiences prior to graduation, uh, that's, that's something I'd like to do for our, for our seniors. So that's one, one example. Excellent point. Anybody else? Well, I'm going to wrap. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. There's a microphone coming your way. <laughs> Hi, Stacey Skelly with Pearson and a proud um, America's Promise partner as well. Um, we actually focus on um, supporting state level work and have a partnership um, with Grad Minnesota mm -hmm. um, to focus on the same populations that you're noting. Um, and I hate to do this, I don't want to be that person, but mm -hmm. a plug, to, not more of a comment, to say next week we're releasing with the Center for Promise a set of research around um, first language, not English students. Mm -hmm. And what they see is what they need to be successful. A lot of that's around caring adults mm -hmm. and making the connection in their mm -hmm. school. So simply a plug that if you're looking for ways to make a difference with that population, there's research coming. So. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. We can't stay here for a week, though, to wait. No, for no, okay. no, no, no. <laughs> we lost it anyway. Oh, okay. So. All right. <laughs> One last call for any questions. Yep, there we go. Hi, Dory O'Donnell with the National Resilience Institute. Um, I just love what I'm hearing, especially in your perspective on caring adults. And just open to the panel, are you using trauma-informed education, um, training, um, train the trainer kind of tools right now to sort of capture that low hanging fruit? I can speak to Minnesota. Yes, uh, <laughs> we are. Uh, we have a number of innovative partnerships, uh, not the least of which is, is with the University of Minnesota and the Center for Resilient Families, which is really working not only in training the trainers, but working with families who are in situations where they've experienced trauma. Um, we also, I can't overstate the partnerships in our grad men, our Graduation Minnesota effort. It includes everything from clinical practitioners to people who are concerned with suspensions and not, you know solutions, not suspensions, um, business chambers, uh, our Department of Human Services. So uh, yes to partnerships and yes to trauma-informed instruction. And it doesn't only, um, like often we think about it with little kids, with all of our littles, and we don't think about the trauma that our high school kids are experiencing and what they're coming to school with. So that has to be, particularly in our low graduation rate schools, that has to be part of the conversation and part of the support we give to the teachers. Anybody else? I'm going to throw out one last question, if I can, because we're talking about really trying to focus on these low graduation rate schools. And I know, for example, in Tennessee, uh, the state's taken over some of these schools, and they've kind of stepped in. Does, is that something that needs to happen? I don't know, from all of your perspective, is there, does there need to be someone to actually step in if a district can't do it and just take over these schools? <laughs> It's we, a loaded question, but I thought we should get oh, it out there. Why, why go out with a softball, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well. Go ahead. Make, make Just curious. What I, I would say that in Minnesota, we have no authority to okay. do any sort of state takeover. <laughs> and I also think that we are a state that really values local control. So we think uh, long and hard and believe that the best path to success and partnership is to provide support and assistance rather than a top-down hammer for compliance. We also know we're not going to move the needle if we don't get our Minneapolis and St. Paul and Duluth and our regional centers moving. And you'll see by the data that those uh, urban schools are, are districts are moving, but um, in terms of taking over, that's not something that I think we'll see in Minnesota anytime soon. Is that a solution at all? Well, uh, we we have some schools close to mine who have who are experiencing that right now, and I can tell you, looking at that, it is not an unalloyed success. 
-hmm. I think the state folks don't know the school very well. They don't know the population, right. and they're seen as outsiders. Uh, and they and they tend to fail to value the work of the people who are there. Right. And unless they're willing to, you know, fire the whole faculty and the principal, uh, I think it's uh, I think it's onerous on the folks who are doing the hard work trying to get the school up to snuff, and it's not necessarily helpful. So. Uh, I think done the, the right way, it can be helpful. If it's more supportive and less punitive, mm -hmm. I think it's it, it's uh, it's helpful. But just as a just as a, as a punishment on a school that's already struggling, right. I don't see that as a way forward. Yeah. So, as one who comes from a state that, until maybe this last session of the legislature, I uh, lost track, could take over schools. I just want to say. It is absolutely the last thing that a governor or a state board of education wants to do for the reasons that you mentioned, because what you're going to have to do is to send people in that probably aren't from that, well, actually, to be safe, you don't want them from the community. Right. You're sending them in, you're disrupting the entire uh, culture eco, ecosystem, um, which in some ways needs to be disrupted, but can you do it other ways? And I think that it is more important that you look at what other nations do, which is you have inspectorates and things like that that come in and look at how to assist as opposed to how to, to how to overthrow. So I just wanna say it is, um, it is absolutely the last option and one from a political and a pragmatic standpoint that a state official tries to avoid at any, at all costs. Okay. Jen, did you have any last thing you want to add as the author of the report? And I mean, I think I think what I think is so great, and, and you mentioned Ginny Edwards, who was with Education Week, of course, for, for decades, fabulous woman. And I remember when I came in there, she said to me, we have the data now. We, we finally have data. We need to use it. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, and I think we need to continue doing it. And I think we need to place a high value on some of the data that we get out of the Office of Civil Rights, which really has given us um, you know, key indicators that we can see of, of what's happening in some of these schools and, and where are points of, of real impact in those schools. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, I, like I said, I, I think this is a really a big positive. I think that it is a very interesting time in education. Um, but I hope that people keep a, you know, a laser-like focus on what matters. Uh, I think that is what's most important. And, and stop with all of the distractions. Um, we need to focus on what kids need. And that, if we do that, I, I think we'll, we'll go in the right direction. OK. Can I have a round of applause for the panel? And we're not quite done. I'm going to introduce John Gomper, the president of America's Promise Alliance, and he's going to wrap us up here. Mercifully short. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, so there are four of us who who are the co-conveners of the Grad Nation campaign, Bo the two Bobs and the two Johns. <laughs> but the most uh, unlikely thing has happened today. This is a historic moment. I'm the one wearing a jacket. Like, <laughs> those of you who know, that is not normal. really normal. Um, let me start to, by echoing some of the thanks that uh, Brother Bridge uh, offered to our sponsors and our friends from Corporation for Public Broadcasting, AT&T, um, and Pearson. It's really great to have you all here today, and we appreciate the partnership with each of you on, on this work. Um, I want to acknowledge and thank all of you for coming and for the people who are um, listening or watching on a live stream. God bless you. Yeah. Thank, you for, <laughs> thank you for joining us. Um, and I, I have to say a point of personal privilege, which I don't often get a point of personal privilege, but I'm going to take one now because I have the microphone. I want to say a special thank you to our friend and colleague, Rachel Fortune who is in her last half hour <laughs> with America's Promise and who has spearheaded the Grad Nation campaign over the last 18 months and has done a marvelous job. She's going home for a big leadership in education uh, job back in her hometown of Jacksonville. But Rachel, thank you for Rachel. all that you've done. So as you've heard, We've made big progress, and we can't ignore that progress. We have to celebrate that progress. And at the same time, that progress is so clearly not enough. On questions of equity, we need to make more progress. In short, I would say we need a breakthrough on equity. Um, Bob talked so well about um, 
you know, maybe we've gotten the easier gains, and the cases that are left are, are not easy cases, and there's no, um, there'll be no benefit to anybody, including especially those young people, if we pretend that that's, that's easy work, right? So, but, but we think that this, we're, so what does it take? We think that it's, we start with one thing, with a mindset, which somebody mentioned along here, which is a mindset that, number one, Every one of these kids can learn and would like to learn. Um, all the research that we have done suggests that um, all kids have real aspirations. Uh, they may have very complicated lives. They may behave in not particularly uh, beneficial ways, but they have real aspirations and would like to get forward. Um, so we have to believe that about them. And as many people have said, starting with uh, Nicole, um, it's our responsibility. Um, this is not somebody else's responsibility. It is not solely the responsibility of schools. It is a collective responsibility that all of us in the community hold to support those schools, support those kids, support the institutions that help young people. Whether it is with your time, with your words, with your voice, with your money, or best of all, with all of that, um, this is a collective responsibility. So. One is that, that sort of two-sided mindset of these kids have real aspirations and real assets and can learn, and two, it's our job to help them do that, even if, or maybe especially if, that's difficult. We heard a lot about states, and it's great to hear and have Charlene here with us from Minnesota, which is one of our partners in, in our work with um, Pearson. Uh, states are obviously key in all this work going forward. Um, as Bridge said, they asked for responsibility, and now they have it. Um, they also have resources, not infinite, but there are resources that are targeted to this particular challenge. Um, we need to figure out the ways to help those states, to support those states, uh, and to keep the accountability up, so to enlist them and to keep the pressure and support for progress up. So states, I think, are key. Um, second, going back to, to what Bob said about the young people who we're really talking about, is um, no pretending about who they are and how complicated this is or how simple some solutions are. Let's just say a lot of really talented people have worked really hard at this challenge for a lot of years. If there were a vaccination, if there were a simple solution, Somebody would have found it by now and would have applied it across the board. It's not that easy. It's really complicated. These young people lead complicated lives that, I, you know, there's housing insecurity and homelessness that affects young people. There is health and safety concerns that affect people. There are economic concerns that affect young people. There's trauma and there's hopelessness in communities that affect young people. And without recognizing all of that, we're apt to fail, right? So you gotta have an inclusive view and stay at it for a long time. Um, you know, this is not a drive-by solution. That would be ever so simple as well. And third, I would say that we have to invest in what works. That's not like there's a single vaccine, there's a single <coughs> thing you can do, but there are things that we have learned <coughs> about data about early warning systems, about the importance of supportive relationships, about the importance of high quality second chances, about high expectations and high support for kids that are struggling. We know all that stuff. We need to put it into practice and we need to not expect miracles. We need to expect that it's gonna take time to make these changes and we need to have the confidence <coughs> that if we do those things, if we do those things, we will move towards real equity, which for us in this campaign means 90% for all young people. 90% on-time graduation for all young people. We believe that's possible. We believe that's our responsibility and that's our work. And we look forward to working with everybody here and many who are not here to help make that happen. So thank you all for being here. Onward. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Good. Thank you so much.